symptomatic of the closures in previous years that people are now travelling to work, miners are travelling to work. Even so, Hetton has been and still remains a mining community where about 50% of the population have mining-related jobs. We, we made such a big pit that the people are scattered. You know, I think there's about 70 busloads travelling to Weymouth each day. Plus there's people from other collieries where their pits have closed have been transferred to Weymouth. Well, one time this was all a pit community until it start knocking down the houses. We have a high continuity of miners, but we have no mi mining community because we have no colony houses, you see. And the colony houses make the mining community as well. All the miners, when they left Horton Pit, moved into the council houses around this area. The colony houses were just out here, on the green belt. That's where the colony houses were, those three rows. North row, middle row and south row. And then we had colony houses all the way up to Horton Pit. And those were all demolished. And that was the death of the minor community in this area. The community here, you see, we're all scattered. I mean, I live on an estate where there's nobody. That's, well, there's two of us. But uh, on our street, that's uh, from a mining family. It's like a modern sort of thing. But and there was no back in where I lived. There was a pit near the village, the Glebe Pit. I think that was the first one to close. And then there was the Washington F Pit closed a few years after that, about the late sixties. And it's just all gone now. So you, we can see what, what is happening. Um, and there are a lot of people saying, well, you didn't do this before, you didn't make this hoo-ha. And that's exactly why there should have been a, a strike and what it was all about. Well, first and foremost, there had to be a kitchen. Because we believed if we kept people fed, that was the most important thing that we had to do at that stage. People could be isolated, and that is a danger. In it. So at least we thought if people are getting one good meal a day, they won't starve the men back to work. We set up on one, one cooker, four rings on the cooker, one oven, a couple of boilers, and just start, and then we were doing about right 400 meals a day to start with. In the church hall, Father Stock gave us these like parish house. And we had one cooker and a sink and a few tables to start off with, which we never expected it would expand to what it did. And yeah, we were there from half past seven in the morning, cooking, cleaning, wow. you name it, we done it <laughs> till about four o'clock in the afternoon, serving about, wait well, first, about 200. And then as the strike went on, it rose to about 500. There was never jobs allotted out to anyone all the way through. It was, um, you were there, you did, and as you walked in, if someone had started to do potatoes or whatever, you picked the next item up and you got on with that, or...? Was we had, we worked a rotor out for different women to come in at different times, and this one morning, I went up at half past seven, and luckily enough, we were having salad, and nobody turned up. So I had the 500 salads to put up. Myself, I managed like, but... <laughs> I got it done. Mm -hmm. No, not really, because I thought, well, they might have had to go somewhere else. They might have been called, because there wasn't really that many of us in the kitchen. And most of them had small children, so, I mean, anything could have happened. You would be sitting and say, oh, I'm sick, fed up, having nothing. And then you'd go around the kitchen, and the rest of the lasses would be <laughs> carrying on and that way. When you come home, you, you know, you just... Well, back to normal, you felt all right, and I think if you were sitting in the house on your own, you know, you would have ended up in Cherry and all, I think. But when you had all the lasses around you in the same boat with the same type of problem, you weren't frightened to talk to people, you know, saying, oh, God, I've got an electric bill and all this, that and the other, you know, you could talk to each other. Oh, cuts, no, 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 cuts,
I was getting from him some two and three pound a week electricity out of that. Mm -hmm. You know, mine. I think that and was because, the worst. And because we fell a week electric. behind with our electricity, we got let us in. They were going to cut it off. Mm. The electricity board you know? gave no. They didn't it's respect terrible. anybody. I think we made a point that we were disgusted with the way we were being treated with the knee. It was great. I think the boy shop they didn't expect so many women in bands to turn out like. But it was a good demonstration. Let the whole country know the way the electricity board were treating us as well, because people don't believe you. You know, when you were telling them what was going on, they wouldn't believe you, would they? You know, they thought you were making half of it up. <laughs> it was just so, so unreal. And I hope you consider very carefully what we're asking you in the letter. Because we are, we're not a special case, we're a needy case. We're not living on the bread line, we're living well below the bread line. Well below. I mean, the strike went on that long. You got used to that standard of living, which you just went into the shop and you just picked up the same things every week. It, um, hardship didn't come all of a sudden. You know, you, you'd learn to live with it, which I suppose some families are living on it all the time.